Well, Philip, welcome to the podcast. And let me just start by saying thank you for all you have done over so many decades, really. I'm I'm grateful. I remember reading like millions of other people, What's So Amazing About Grace when it first came out in, when was that? 97, 98, I'm going to say. 98, I think it was. 98. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember just how powerful that was. And so do a lot of other leaders. So thank you for being on the podcast. Well, it's going to be fun just to talk with you, Carrie. Glad to get acquainted this way. I want to dig into your um, memoir, your your uh, latest book, Where the Light Fell. But, you know, I do have one of the greatest writers of our generation on the line with me today. Um, and we were just chatting a little bit back and forth before we hit record about how writing has changed. Hmm. A lot of aspiring writers, young writers, um, longtime writers listening to the podcast. What is your uh, take on on writing today and how it's changed? Boy, when I meet with young writers, I say you're living in the best of times and the worst of times. The best of times, I can write, you can write a blog today that will be read in a few hours, actually, in yeah. Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, in Japan, in China. That's never happened before in history. We can, we can literally connect with people around the world. So the ability to expand reach is unprecedented. And it's, it's thrilling. I get a lot of, uh, international mail, email, because I, I've traveled to many of these countries. My books are published there. And it is just thrilling to see how they take something I wrote in my little room in Colorado and apply it in very different circumstances where they live. So that's the best part. The negative part is it's getting harder and harder to make a living mm. as a writer. That's true of musicians. It's true of movie makers. You know, Amazon cuts the royalty rates by about 50%. So you do the same amount of work you did a few years ago and you get half the money. It's, it's just hard to have a career based on that. And at the other, at the other extreme, back in my day, in my day, he says, like an old man, um, <laughs> <laughs> I would spend at least a year on a book. So I would spend right. months in libraries and then months just isolated, cranking out the first draft and then more months editing over and over. Now everything is chopped up. It's instant. It's bite sized. It's, it's very hard for people to do deep reading. Uh, they, they we're getting interrupted all the time by email messages, by cell phones, by texts. And times are changing. I, I, I find that a kind of a scary vision of the future, what it's going to look like. Will people really put up with these long 700 page books, which theologians put out that you really need to explore the depth of what we're talking about? And I don't know if it's going to be happening 20 years from now. That's a really good point, Philip. I mean, we've had Cal Newport on the podcast and others who talk about the value of deep work and um, the problem with distraction near AL has been a guest as well who wrote the book Hooked on how to hook people and also mm. indistractable. <laughs> and yeah, what it, what do you think is at stake when people don't have the ability to focus for 400 pages or in deep thought or even to prepare at that level, let alone to read at that level? Like, what do you think happens to our culture in that kind of a distracted environment? Well, you, you can see what happens. It becomes very me-oriented, very self-oriented. You don't see people sitting back and thinking about the big picture and the, the great sweep of history and some of those things. And they're not, they're not even thinking about culture so much in a, in a group. It's, it's self-help. Watch, watch the books on the bestseller list. They're not exploring great topics. They're not showing us a different side of Jesus or the parables or the Old Testament that we never thought about before. They're immediate. Um, and very me oriented. And I, I think that's, that's scary. There's some of that in the Bible. There's certainly practical advice, but. Our main concern is to take the set of truth that we believe we've been given and apply it in all sorts of contexts that are modern, that are new. And that takes some deep thinkers out there. Some of the, the Canadians like Charles Taylor, um, 
is one person. He wrote this book, The Secular Age, about a 900 page book, as I recall. And I, well, I went all the way through it. And, and it, it takes that kind of commitment to really explore the topic of why did the West suddenly stop believing when for centuries it had believed? What happened? What created the secular age? It's a great question that pastors and others should be exploring. And it takes a person like Charles Taylor who commits himself for several years on a project like that. But if nobody reads it, we're not going to value and we're not going to learn from his advice. One of my favorite things about this podcast, almost 500 episodes in, is quickly becoming um, most of my audience, as I told you earlier before we started recording, is younger. Um, But I love having conversations with people who have long pre-digital memories like yourself. And I do mm-hmm. as well at my age, you know, mid to late 50s. I have a pretty strong um, pre-digital memory. What, what are or what were your rhythms when it comes to preparing a book, thinking deeply, reading a 900-page tome, um, preparing to write one of your many books? What are some of the rib- rhythms and habits and disciplines that you either did value or still value that help you focus on bigger, deeper issues, Philip? Yeah. I used to write a lot of articles for Christianity Today. I wrote a column for them for about 26 years and then longer articles as well. And when I would get a long article, say five to 7,000 words, I would budget a whole week and two days would be getting ready to write. (laughs) And that means... (laughs) In some cases, that means interviewing a person to do a profile and then researching and getting more information that that will help me in the the process of writing. And then one day, that middle day, to actually do the first draft to compose. And that is where, Carrie, that is where all the pain is. It's that blank computer screen. It's that blank piece of paper and all these terrible voices going on in your head. You've said this before, it's the cliche, nobody's interested. And you gotta just force yourself through those things and get something down on paper. And then two days to clean it up. I began my my editorial career as an editor rather than a writer, and so I really value editing. And once I have something down on paper, I figure I can always make it better. I, I've done it long enough not to make it worse, but It's that middle day. And if you blow that up into a year, 40% of my time getting ready to write, 20% of my time actually putting it down on paper, and then 40%, twice as much, 40% cleaning it up and making it better. And, and, uh, that's what I've done. I, this memoir, you know, I, I spent, um, at least three solid years, the better part of five years, I found it, I found a, draft from five years before I turned it in. And in the process of doing that, I'd never written a memoir before. I'd, I write these essay-oriented, idea-driven books, and this was a whole new genre for me. So I started reading every memoir I could get my hands on. I ended up reading over 300. I, I still have a list, 300 memoirs all the way through. And from every one, I learned something. Usually they sparked a memory in my childhood that I wouldn't have retrieved otherwise, but something about what they said hit a chord, and then I came up with a detail that I wouldn't have come up with otherwise. So that was that 40%, getting ready to write, just figuring yeah. out how to do it. <laughs> that seems like such a a luxury at the pace that we live at. But mm-hmm. I also think of writers like yourself, I think of preachers like Tim Keller, who, you know, as, as, as he would say, on a good day, I write some original stuff when I preach. On a bad day, I just quote C.S. Lewis. Uh, but the <laughs> point true. is, I think that's a great joke. Uh, but the point is, he's read all of C.S. Lewis multiple times, as well as the ancients and others. And then sometimes you see it in the next generation. I see that in John Mark Comer, who's in his very mm-hmm. early 40s, who has just spent 15, 20 years reading regularly, or Mark Sayers. Um what, yeah, just, just speak to the leader who is stuck on social, who is reading little sound bites and clips and watching videos, who maybe doesn't have the discipline to read 300 memoirs, let alone 30. What, what are they missing? What are they missing out on? Well, it's hard to answer that because I've been doing it so long. It's the only way I know. Um, 
what Tim Keller said, you know, even C.S. Lewis said, I'm not creating new material, original material. I'm creating original ways of mere Christianity. You know, he goes to the classics. He goes to the Greeks and Romans and, and, uh, and the Elizabethans and Victorians and, and draws from them, draws from that well of spiritual depth that, that he knew so well. And, that's how that's how I think. I, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, when I saturate myself, like a book on Jesus. I remember I, I wrote this book, "The Jesus I Never Knew," and I started reading books about Jesus. And I went down to the to three seminary libraries: one's Catholic, one's liberal Protestant, one's conservative Protestant, and just started reading shelves and shelves of books on Jesus. And I was trying to figure out. If I wanted to write another book, because there were like 65,000 books on Jesus. Does the world need another book on Jesus? And then I realized I, I, all I have is a point of view. It's different than your point of view. It's different than Tim Keller's point of view. It's different than anybody's point of view. And mine happened to be shaped by growing up in, in extreme fundamentalism, kind of putting my faith aside for a while, being burned by it, and then, and rediscovering it. And, as I looked at Jesus, I realized he is so different than the person I was taught in Sunday school growing up. And that's why I came up with the title, The Jesus I Never Knew. He was there all along. I never knew him. I was given this cardboard cutout Jesus that was not the person that I got to know in the Gospels. And it was really only by that period of saturating myself in other points of view that I discovered my own. I guess that's one way to put it. Uh, the first question you ask yourself when you write a book is, does the world really need this book? And if the answer is no, there, there are other ways to spend your time, you know, go play golf or something, <laughs> you know. But if the answer is yes, you really have to find a different slant. And the only way you know what your slant is, is by acquainting yourself with others. Hmm. I want to get to your book because it is uh, fascinating and the story you tell is really fascinating in it, Philip. Any, uh, and maybe we'll, we could perhaps in the future do a round two just on the art of writing, which I think would be absolutely worth whatever time we put into that. But if you had a word for the aspiring writer, whether that's the preacher who's got 40 messages, 30 messages a year, he or she has to deliver to uh, somebody who wants to write a book or is starting out in writing, what what is like what would you encourage them to do or to focus on to make their craft better? I'd say a couple things. I, when I started writing, I would uh, look at a topic. I was given an assignment and I would think of all the things I could put into that article. And then I would say, no, I, I've got to save something for the next article. So I would pull back, pull back. Hmm. And what I learned is, don't ever do that. Give everything you have to what's in front of you, no matter what it is. Other stuff will come, especially if you keep reading, if you keep interviewing other people. But don't hold back. It's it's not something you can parcel out because that's where the passion comes in. If you give everything you have, readers will pick that up. They'll realize this is a commitment. It's not just an assignment. It's it's mm -hmm. a work of passion. And, and a lot of people say, I, I differ on this one. A lot of people say, when you start writing, have one reader in mind. Pick a 42 year old mother of two. Uh, and she's sitting in a chair. She's got 30 minutes to herself because somebody's watching the kids or something and think of that woman. No, I, that doesn't help me at all. I really, I write for myself. I find something that I struggle with, that I don't know the answer to, that bothers me, and try to work my way through it, try to fight my way through that thicket, that jungle, and go out the other side. And if I do that with enough passion and carefulness, then other people will follow. But if I try to put myself inside of somebody else's mind and say, what, does, what would they like to hear from me? I go blank. <laughs> I can't think of anything. And I don't, it, for me, at least, it's not a helpful exercise. So I just, I try to keep the focus on what am I struggling with? What don't I know the answer to? I, I joke, Carrie, that uh, when I don't know 
the answer to a question, I write a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really true. Because uh, unlike pastors, theologians, I'm not an expert in any one field. I'm a journalist. And that's what we do. We go to we go to different areas of, that we don't know anything about and try to make sense of, it, of them in a way that we can teach our readers in the newspaper, magazine, book, whatever we're doing. So uh, I, I really write my books for myself about things I don't know the answer to. Well, uh, Where the Light Fell is an autobiography of sorts. And I want to ask you, like, why this and why now? This is this is book number what for you so far? Oh, a couple dozen. So 25, yeah. 26, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Why now? Okay, I'm 72. It's a time to reflect on <laughs> on other, uh, on just summing up life. And what struck yeah. me over the years, I'm kind of contradicting what I just told you about, put it all in every article, but over the years, there are stories that defined who I am that I've never told. And the reason I've never told them is because of family issues, because they're, they're close, intimate stories. And I just didn't feel free while the people were living and, and could be wounded by them. But as I, as they've gotten older and some have passed away, I've started listening to my life. That's a phrase from Frederick Buechner, listen to your life, he says. And when I started listening to my life, I realized that I was given a, a, a gift that didn't feel like a gift. The gift was I grew up in this really extreme family, extreme circumstances, and a really extreme church. Now, when you grow up in that setting, you don't think it's extreme. You think it's normal. You think everybody else right. is strange. And so I wasn't aware of just how strange it was until later. And then you ask me, why now? Okay, part of it is my age. It's the time to reflect. I call this book, Where the Light Fell, a prequel to everything else I've written. It, it, mm. You can see what I think by reading the other books. And if you read this book, you'll understand more why I think it and why I chose to write about the things that I write. The other thing that I noticed around me, I lived through the 1960s. That was the formative time of my youth. And people talk about the United States has never been so divided since the Civil War or something like that. Well, I don't know about that. It was pretty bad in the 60s. There were a thousand bombings a year. People, university students were taking their presidents hostage. There were a million people marching in the streets against the Vietnam War. Uh, the civil rights movement was going on in, in some ways that almost resembled a war. So all that stuff, that chaos with everything being up in the air was going on in the 1960s. And, and then we thought we had, I thought we had dealt with some of those issues. And then here they are right back, you know. War yeah. and, and justice and, and human rights and civil rights and racism. And it's just in the news every day. And the whole democracy is kind of under attack. And, and we have some things to learn from a period not that far away. Unfortunately, as I look at it, at least the church has not been a healing force in the midst of this chaos. If anything, it's been a divisive force. And so I, I know about divisive churches. I grew up in one. And I wanted to mine that, that experience and, and put it out in the open and get people to think about their own experience. One of the things I learned about memoirs, you think you write a memoir, you think you read a memoir because you want to learn something about somebody else. Actually, you're the one you, who you learn about. <laughs> when, when I get letters today, almost every one of them, they start off by saying, oh, thank you for your memoir. And then they tell me their story. That's mm -hmm. what a memoir does. It, it just stimulates your memory. And so you face, well, by reading about my life, you face your own life, how it was the same, how it was different. And because mine was extreme, Nobody actually had the same life I did, but it, there are various shades along the way where what I experienced, the kind of racism and the blatant fundamentalism and those kinds of things, they they leak away in, in other settings as well. How old were you in the most tumultuous years of 
the 1960s, which I think a lot of people would put at somewhere between 67 and 1970 were probably the most difficult years, 68 being a real flashpoint. Correct me if, if you have a different understanding, but roughly right. how old were you? Like? Well, my college years were 66 to 70. Okay. So that was right smack in the middle of it. I would have been a junior in college when 1968 and all that chaos broke down. And my brother yeah. became one of the first hippies in Atlanta. They were brand new. Uh, he dropped out of college with one semester to go, you know. Oh. He's after freedom. You can't make me graduate. I'll just drop out of the school. So he did. <laughs> and would spend a lot of time in the parks of Atlanta uh, taking LSD and watching the landscape unfold around him. And sadly, brilliantly talented musician, as much natural talent as anybody I've ever met. He, instead of becoming a concert pianist, which he should have, he became a piano tuner because he, he pretty much fried his brain on LSD. And that was part of the 60s as well. So it's a story of two brothers. We both grew up in a weird family, a weird church. We took two different routes. My brother wanted to get as far away from that as possible. And I was kind of stuck in it and having to come to terms with what's worth keeping and what do I need to discard. Those are the two different trajectories we we are. Hmm. Let's uh, do some of the backstory then. Um, you know, you talk about, and I want to get the time, <laughs> you grew up in Georgia, in Atlanta, in a culture of, quote, white, racist, paranoid fundamentalism. Um, can you unpack that for us? What... What kind of church, like, and and I want to hear the story of your father, too, sure. who died when you were one. Right, I'll start there because the book starts there, and it's the defining event of my life in a lot of ways, mm. even though mm. I had no conscious choice in it. I was a year old. And my father and mother were planning to be missionaries in Africa. They had raised support. They had several thousand people on their mailing list who agreed to pray for them and support them. And they were just on the cusp of going to Africa when a pandemic hit. Different pandemic than today. It was the polio pandemic. Mm. And it was especially feared because it affected mostly children. You, you would see so many children walking around in braces and crutches. And my father was 23. He wasn't a child, but he was young and in the prime of his life. And now suddenly, overnight, literally, he was completely paralyzed, could not move a muscle in his body, and could not even breathe on his own. So he was put in an iron lung, one of these machines that worked like a vacuum, forcing air in and out to force his lungs to breathe. And he, he lay on his back, unable to move for two and a half months, pretty miserable months. It was a charity hospital, the only one in Atlanta that had iron lungs. Well, some people, the people who were supporting him could not possibly see how it could be God's will for for him to be paralyzed the rest of his life or to die because he was going to be a missionary, for goodness sake. So they started praying, and they became convinced that he should be healed, that he would be healed. Uh, Jesus healed paralytics. Didn't it seem to be a clear case where God should intervene? So they prayed and believed so strongly that against medical advice, he was removed from that iron lung and put in a little clinic that was really not equipped to deal with polio patients. He showed a little bit of improvement, but he only lived about two weeks, and then he died. And my mother, well, that how did it define my life? For one thing, we were poor from then on. I mean, really poor. Mm -hmm. We lived in a trailer all through high school. Uh, we lived in a trailer eight feet wide and 48 feet long. You Canadians will have to do the... the oh, we still measure in feet. Parallel. Don't ask oh, okay. me about the hybrid mess of the... Uh, I can tell you how many pounds I am, not how many kilos, but okay. I'll measure I'll measure the distance in kilometers. Yeah, we're a bunch of weirdos, but... Uh, okay, Yeah. Great. Anyway, yeah, so you're, you're yeah, living in this trailer small park. Small little yeah, trailer. I, think, yeah. I went to... Five grammar schools in six years because every time they raise the rent, we would go find another one, a cheaper wow. place. And then I, I, my mother emerged from that with a very rigid faith. I, I mentioned that my worst 
My least favorite story in the Bible is the story of Hannah giving her son Samuel to the temple mm. to be a priest. And the reason that's my least favorite is that's that's what my mother did with my brother and me. Probably as kind of a guilt offering, she participated in that decision to have him removed, a decision that proved fatal. So how do you how do you justify that? How do you how do you redeem something like that? Well, the way she redeemed it was by giving my brother and me to God to replace our father as a missionary in Africa. Well, we didn't do that. And when we didn't do that, it became a weapon. It became a kind of curse. Uh, to stories you, you would have to read to believe the true stories about how seriously she took that vow. She's, she doesn't read my books. She just approves of who I am and really disapproves of who my brother is. So that set up this constant family tension. And then we started going to these extreme fundamentalist churches. The pastors mostly came from Bob Jones University. They were small churches. They were proud of the word fundamentalist. They, they didn't shy away from that at all. In fact, our church had this I think it was like an 11-point star out front with all these words, premillennial, dispensational, Bible-believing, New Testament, blood-bought, you know, just defining everything they believed in the in the billboard there. And uh, in addition to that, in addition to being real right-wing fundamentalist, they were also racist. So one of the better churches I went to was a church called Colonial Hills, had over a 1,000 members. This one did. But then during the civil rights movement, they posted deacons at the door, turning away any people of color who tried to enter in, calling them troublemakers. I, I still have a, in the book, I reproduce a card that they would give these people. And you're, you're not really a child of God. You're just a troublemaker. Oh. And they, they softened it a bit over time. Um, there was a all black, African-American Bible college in Atlanta called Carver. One of the students liked our church. He liked the Bible teaching, and he asked if he could come. And he said, well, you can sit in here. And he liked it so much. So finally he said, can I join your church? And they had a big meeting and unanimously said no. Man's name was Tony Evans, who's a mega church pastor, <laughs> college student at the time. And, you know, he kind of laughs about it now. But, um, but imagine how many sins were committed uh, just from the sin of racism. Um, they started a white school so you didn't have to go to school with, with black children. So, And this is that in the was 1960s a, and 70s. Correct. Yeah, it was still Jim yeah. Crow era. You know, Martin Luther King, who was from Atlanta, would lead these demonstrations because uh, the nicest rest, the nicest uh, department store in town was a store called Riches. And they had a white dining room at the top and a black cafeteria down at the bottom. And they had white elevators and black elevators, or colored, they called them. White drinking fountains, colored drinking fountains, same with restrooms. And the... And everything was separated. We just assumed that's the way it was. And then he's, they would allow black people to shop and buy their clothes there, but they weren't allowed to try them on. And then they couldn't return them, of course. So Martin Luther King's first arrest in Georgia was when he let a sit-in protest against Rich's department store uh, to reverse that. He, he opened up the restaurant at the top. And he made it possible for them to actually try on clothes before they bought them. <laughs> Imagine. But that's the way it was back in the early 1960s. Well, and that's one of the things, too, that I think is so easy to forget. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, people listening to this weren't alive in that era. I was in the late 60s. I was a baby and then eventually, you know, a kid. I, my only memory of the Vietnam War is it kept interrupting my cartoons every time they complained about, you know, something that was happening in Vietnam. Uh, the news would break in. But, you know, we listen to some of the music today. If you're a fan of Neil Young or, you know, 70s rock like the Eagles, yeah, that was the era that this was still going on in. And I've interviewed Gordon McDonald a few times and had the privilege of also interviewing Eugene Peterson before he died. And they both talked about the 1960s and King. And 
you know, it's very easy from a 2022 lens to look back on that time and go, well, how could people do that? But it was really controversial in the 60s and 70s. Do you want to take us back into like, you know, you're you're seeing this, you're growing up in this. Uh, you say your mother was a racist. And mm -hmm. so were most of the Christians you grew up in. How did they justify it? Like why, why was what King was doing in the 60s so controversial? I think it was fear. The laws, the Jim Crow laws that separated the races were stricter and stricter depending on the percentage of African Americans in the state. So Georgia, uh, Georgia had about 35% or so. Alabama had maybe 45%. Mississippi had almost 50%. And the further, the, the further you got into the states where there was almost a majority of African Americans, the more rigid the laws became. I mean, look at South Africa. There you had 5 million whites, 20 million blacks, and you got to have real strict laws to keep that from exploding. Never and thought I thought about that. And they were just afraid. They, they had the power. Uh, if you go on a bus, a city bus to a downtown Atlanta in those days, there'd be very few white people, even though there were rows reserved for white people where blacks couldn't sit. And so you got maids who are cleaning white houses and then workers that are, that are working in landscaping and jobs like that. So their schools were bad. It's difficult to get a good education, get a, because the schools were completely separate. Mm -hmm. Only when I was, I think, a freshman in high school did they start integrating any schools in the Atlanta area. The Ku Klux Klan was still a, a live force. I remember going to a, or not going, I remember driving. And then on the other side of the road, there was a long line of cars, turned out to be five miles long. And it was the funeral of one of the Ku Klux Klan leaders, the Grand Wizard. So we had to sit there and wait while five miles worth of cars turned into this, into this place where they were holding the funeral and they were all dressed in their hoods. And I mean, that was a scary force. I, I went, um, to, a a rally. I, I talk about at a speedway in Atlanta, George Wallace spoke and Lester Maddox, who was a, a, running for governor of Georgia, George Wallace, of course, in Alabama. And Ku Klux Klan people spoke, and a few very brave black people showed up, men. And it started kind of a riot. They were, the KKK surrounded them, started beating them, hitting them with chairs. And finally, the police made them stop. And, and these very courageous, but now beaten and bloody African Americans kind of slunk away after being humiliated like that. And it, it was, it was a power thing. We've got the power and you don't. And we like it this way, and we control the wealth, and we control the laws, and we control the courts. I mean, by law, a black doctor could not treat a white patient. A white doctor could not treat a black patient by law. Wow. It was uh, some places it was so bad. There was a cemetery in Atlanta that had a, a an area for pets, dogs and cats, and they had a they had an area for pets of colored people <laughs> and pets of white people. I mean, how ridiculous can you get? <laughs> you know, and we have this idea of progress, Philip, and yet you look at some of the schisms that are around today, and perhaps we've made some progress in some areas, but, um, you know, racism is still alive and well, injustice is still alive and yes. well. Uh, division is still very alive and well. And the tone in the public discourse has become so much more belligerent over the last decade and divided and deep. What parallels do you see in our culture today versus the era of the 60s and 70s that you just described? We miss moral leadership. Some of the old timers in the civil rights movement are saying, we used to get together in the churches and we would sing and we would pray and we would embolden each other with courage because it took, it took courage to go out there knowing somebody's gonna turn a fire hose on you or just turn a German shepherd dog loose on you or hit you with a club, billy club on the, on the back of the head. That took courage. And 
And those guys, Martin Luther King at the front, he was brilliant in saying, it's got to be nonviolent. That's the only way to change hearts. You can maybe change laws with violent protests, but you can't change hearts. And I've got to find a way to love that policeman who's hitting me with a billy club and understand him and understand why he's doing that. And and people would protest, and some would form different splinter groups. But he was so consistent on that, and and we lack that now. It's everything is adversarial. Well, it was adversarial then too. But King was so strong. He said, "My goal is is not to change the law. My goal is to change hearts. My goal is to create the beloved community mm-hmm. where we don't we don't see color. You know, we don't judge by the we judge by the character, not the not the color of the skin." And, and I don't see much of that today. Um, there's a, there's a monument in Atlanta in the Martin Luther King Center. I, I'm pretty sure that's where it is about martyrs in the civil rights movement. And I think there are about 20 people, three kids found in a dam in, in Mississippi, buried, shot and buried there. And, and others, you, you know, of Martin Luther King himself, of course. But when you think about it, this massive social movement, unbelievably massive, 20 people die. I mean, that many people die in the streets of places like Belarus and, and, uh, you know, major American cities someday. Yeah. Major American cities. Yeah. And not to belittle those deaths, they were tragic, tragic deaths. But King was right. If, if he had gone and armed, the small minority who would have been like 13% of the population and said, okay, let's take on, let's take on the whiteies. It would have been a slaughter. It would have just been a slaughter. And he knew that. And plus he knew it was wrong. And, and the way to change was, was by appealing to the, to the morality, of both of the whites. There's a real good book called a stone of hope, which is for Hayes from Martin Luther King in his speech at Washington, a stone of hope. And it talks about the role that the Southern churches played, both good and bad. But the guy, uh, as he wrote it, he was agnostic, really not a person of faith. But the more he analyzed what, what King said and what King believed and the effect that that had, he, be, he became a believer in, and wrote, uh, pretty convincingly about the whole process. And I, I don't see that now. You know, I wish, I pray. For moral leadership, somebody like a king. On the one hand, you've got this cancel culture. They won't even listen to another side. On the other hand, you got people invading the Capitol building of the United States. You know, it's just so divided now. And they both have their strong rhetoricians, but I don't see anybody talking to, to both sides. And in those days, there were people who did. Hmm. I want to go back to your childhood again. And um, let's talk about the branch of, just to, to paint a clearer picture of the kind of rhetoric you were exposed to by your mom in your church, uh, you know, that white, racist, paranoid fundamentalism. Talk about the paranoia. And then I also want to touch on when you learned about your father's cause of death, because that was another mm-hmm. seminal moment in your life, Philip. Right. Right. Yeah. So describe describe your worldview. I guess is what I'm asking you, as a child. Okay. We went to a church of maybe a hundred people, and we actually lived on the church property. We parked our tiny aluminum trailer on church property, so we could never get okay. away. Whenever the doors were open, right. we were always there. And they would have a revival tent in the summer, and I'd mow the grass. You know, I mean, we lived at church. We were just saturated. My mother taught. She was a Bible teacher. And then at summer, we go to these camps and hear the same lessons over and over all summer long. We could recite them. You know? It was a good way to you learn them by heart. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, it would be probably lower class economically, people in the church. And you'd see the same people. We rarely had visitors, but the pastor would always preach about sin and hell. And we had all gone forward and received Jesus as our Savior, you know, whatever you're supposed to do, pray the sinner's prayer. We'd, we'd done that multiple times. And 
that would be, became a haunting thing for me later because how do you tell when it's real and when it's just repeating the same thing? You've done it before. But in those days, I guess my question was, why does the pastor keep trying to get us to go forward when we've already gone forward? And he talks about sin, and these are the same people. There were very few words of comfort or words of grace, really. It, it was the uh, sinners in the hand of an angry God. <laughs> Basically, that's how I felt every every Sunday and Wednesday and Friday, whenever else the church was open. It was mixed in with this racism. In fact, they I don't know if you've ever heard this curse of ham theory, but they, they mm-hmm. taught it straight. It's a weird passage. In Genesis 9, Noah has uh, saved his family on the ark, and then they're back on dry land. And what's he do? He gets drunk. You think he'd yeah. talk about moral leadership? <laughs> and <there's, laughs> the uh, the Bible doesn't give any details about what happened. It says that his sons looked on his nakedness. Well, there must have been some other stuff going on that it doesn't mention because when he wakes up and realizes what happened, he's angry. And he has three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And he chooses Canaan, the son of Ham, his grandson, and curses him. He gives a curse. He says, you're going to be serving in the tents of Shem forever. Well, the word ham, according to some translations, means burnt black. So uh, slave traders, Arab slave traders first, and, and Jewish and then British missionaries in Africa, got this theory, oh, that's where the black race came from. They were cursed by God, and they are supposed to serve. And the, I have and the, no idea. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's a crazy theory because God didn't curse Ham. Right. Actually, God didn't curse anybody. It was Noah. <laughs> it was so Noah, Noah yeah. 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 Noah cursed Ham. And, 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 excuse me. Noah cursed Canaan. Hmm. But the curse of Ham theory somehow went away from that scene saying, God cursed the black race. And that was used by Arab slave traders, by Jews, by uh, whites. And then uh, it was taught in my church. I heard it from two different churches growing up. And it became an easy, oh, that's why... That's why blacks are like that. And they, you'll never see, I remember this evangelist, you'll never see an African American, which of course he didn't call him that. You'll never see an African American person as CEO or head of a country or, yeah, we in the United States have had one, right? Obama, but we were told, yeah, yeah. yeah, Yeah. this is impossible. This will never happen. They're good at serving. They make good waiters Mm -hmm. and make good servants. And, you can almost you can hardly believe that anybody would come up with that, but it was taught from the pulpit, and that became a huge crisis of faith for me because I ended up working at the Center for Disease Control. It's called the Communicable Disease Center at the time. Yeah. This huge, outstanding uh, scientific place in in the suburbs of Atlanta, and I went to work the first day. I was scared because I knew my my supervisor was this PhD from an Ivy League school who was a world-renowned expert in staining bacteria. (laughs) And I tried to read some of his papers, couldn't understand them. And I walk in, and it's a black man. And I almost dropped all my papers, and bells went off. The church has lied to me. The -hmm. curse of ham theory, which I was told was truth, it's from the Bible. It's a distortion. It's not true. And if they lied to me about that, maybe they lied to me about Jesus. Maybe they lied to me about the Bible. It became a, a real crisis of faith for me. And you were how old at the time, Philip? I would have been 16 then. 16. So at 16, 16. that's what made you think maybe the narrative that I've been fed isn't the truth, isn't the correct thing. And it prompted a real crisis of faith, both in you and your brother. And you've hinted at your brother sort of becoming one of the first hippies and really struggling through life uh, as a result of, you know, some of the things that happened to him and some of the things that he did uh, as a young man. Um, How do you pick up your story? How did that, that crisis of faith, I want to ask it because there's a lot of deconstruction happening 
deconversion mm-hmm. happening right now in the church where people are doing just that. And yet you end up embracing Jesus at the end of the day. So what was that journey out of the Christianity of your childhood or whatever that was um, mm-hmm. of your childhood? Um, what was that like for you? How did that happen? I took a different tack than my brother. My mother had this very rigid theology. She believed she hadn't sinned in 15 years or so. And when you're a teenage boy, it's hard to win an argument with your mother when she hasn't sinned. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and yet, and yet, okay. And you say this in the book, so I'm not trying to dredge stuff that isn't public, but like your mother was not a kind woman behind closed doors. Is that no, fair, and not a healthy woman. Um, mm. When people have written reviews and things in the book, they talk about abuse. I, I didn't think that growing up. We didn't really hear much about abuse growing up. Every, every kid I knew got spanked. She was anger than most. And she did try to attack us with a tennis racket. You know, there were some moments there, but hmm. she, she was, I, I really believe she was doing the best she could. She came from a, a much worse family, frankly. And was a softer, gentler version of what she had grown up under. But uh, I, I saw that he always lost uh, because the adult wins. Yeah, my brother always lost. And they would have these screaming matches. He's a great pianist. He's playing this this uh, old Sunday school hand down, hand me down piano, and they'd be screaming at each other. And I didn't want to go there. So I just said, okay, I'm going to get to a place where they can't get me. They, mm-hmm. <laughs> the church, my mother. Mm-hmm. So I went on a, I read Nietzsche. I read Kierkegaard. I read yeah. uh, um, the French existentialists. And they all talked about getting to a place where you feel nothing. I yeah. read Buddhist books, Siddhartha. And so I, I would go out in the cold in the winter. Of course, it's not that cold in it, in Georgia, but without a jacket and wearing a t-shirt and do my paper route or the, or in the summer, you know, I'd wear a coat just to prove there's no such thing as heat or cold. No such thing as a good smell or a bad smell. No such thing as beauty and ugliness. And, and what I describe in the book, I took that very seriously and eventually ended up well, I somehow I got to conquer pain, and I, I got to the point where I actually broke my own arm on purpose just to see if I could handle it, handle the pain. And, you know, I look back on that, and you see kids today, we have, they have their own coping mechanisms, anorexia and bulimia and self-harming. I guess I, I was a self-harmer, too. I didn't even know what that phrase and it's terrifying, I'm sure, as a parent when you see that happen. But usually it's a sign of a kid trying to find a way to get through a, just a crazy period. And I call it turtling down to get to the place where nothing anybody said or did could get to me. And then I had to go back and rebuild a personality later. It's, it's harder to deconstruct. It's easier to deconstruct than to construct, I learned. <laughs> What did you do to your arm and what happened to it? Did you end up in, you know, the ER down the road? Sure. I had to, I had to have it set. Um, I had fallen or something. It was a crazy year. I had six broken arms and a broken jaw. So oh, wow. broken arms were, were not a stranger to me. I knew them. And when I heard it in a fall, I, I was almost positive it had not broken, but it was painful. So we had these metal bunk beds and I went in and just mashed it against the bunk bed until it finally broke. You know, it took, took about three tries. Oh. And yeah, I mean, it was, it was a weird time. I, I do tell parents, um, don't completely freak out, get, get help, of course, but kids sometimes have to go through unhealthy ways to survive. Um, and, and, and just get, look for these signs and try to find them help, but don't go ballistic. That doesn't, doesn't really help. So I did become fairly impervious to what people thought of me and uh, ended up in a Bible college of all places, which is a story in itself. It was the cheapest place, one of the only places I could afford. And my mother just absolutely insisted that we go to a Bible college. 
my brother had already spun off in his in his spiral toward confusion and I quickly learned, you know, I don't really want to be like these Bible college people. I don't like them. They all have these pasty smiles and happy face cliches. So I'm going to be the campus renegade. And I would sit out in the, in the sunshine in the chair reading Bertrand Russell's Why I Am Not a Christian or Harvey, That's Harvey Cox's. Bible. Yeah. Harvey Cox's Secular City, you know, those kind of books. And people would pray for me, and the faculty would put them on their on their uh, concern list. My brother, two or three times, had demons. People who tried to cast demons out of him. Nothing, nothing really happened. And and then the the name of the memoir we've been talking about is "Where the Light Fell," hmm. and that comes from a quote by Saint Augustine, who said, "I couldn't look at the sun directly, but I could look on where the light fell." And that was my story. I couldn't look at the sun directly. God, I had been scorched. My image of God was this bully, this terrifying roast, roaster of humans, you know. And um, and I found out through three things, nature, classical music, and romantic love. That's where the light fell for me, those three things. Mm. And here I had this bulletproof shell around me that nobody could get to, but somehow those three things, the beauties of classical music and nature, they were my solace, and then falling in love. And I, I realized that God was not that bully. God, whoever was responsible for this earth, was an artist. And I was experiencing grace without even knowing the word. But I had been so schooled in how to go through the motions, give the testimonies, pray the prayers. And and I didn't I couldn't tell the real from the fake. And I tried a couple of times and finally just gave up. And that's when I became the campus renegade. And then I go on to describe uh the hinge moment of my life, which was the conversion experience that I wasn't wasn't seeking, wasn't planning for, didn't even want. At the time, it was it was a kind of revelation, and I've waited all these years to give so many details to it because I know people will say, "Well, I didn't have one of those." Well, you're right; God deals with us differently. But God knew that I needed something from outside, not something that I could create on my own, that I could manipulate and control. It had to be something unexpected that that just swept me away, and it, it changed everything from then on. And ever since, you ask how, how do you get out of that? How do you find health out of that? Well, I went ahead and graduated from the Bible College. We graduated early, and then I went to Wheaton. And there, very quickly, my career took shape. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I wanted to play baseball for the New York Yankees. <laughs> you know? But I, I had always liked writing in the school yearbook, in the newspaper, and and got a job at Campus Life magazine. and. Very quickly met this man, Dr. Paul Brand. We've written three books together. Who was a saint? He's the father I never had. A, a brilliant scientist. He thought through every question I had ever thought thought about, and had answers for them, and was honest and vulnerable, and just lived out his faith. And we ended up spending almost ten years together. I followed him around the world and wrote these books, fearfully, wonderfully made in his image, in his the gift of pain. And it gave my chance, my faith a chance to go into a cocoon phase, I call it, where I wasn't writing about what I believed. I was writing about Dr. Brand and what he believed. And it, and that, I, that was easy because he, he lived it. He was consistent. And it gave me a, a period of time to develop my own faith. And then finally, after I'd been writing for 15 years, I started going back gently at first. I mean, look at my first books. Where is God when it hurts? Disappointment with God. I mean, I was, that's where I was. I was out in the margins. And then only gradually took years for me to spiral in so that I could write books like What's Amazing About Grace and The Jesus I Never Knew and Prayer. You know, if you told me 20 years before then you're going to write a book about prayer, I would have just laughed. Mm -hmm. But uh, the career that I've had 
it's or the calling, I guess, is to is to go through and decide what's worth keeping. It's kind of like downsizing a house. You know, you go through some things you you just got to keep, and other things you they're just trash. Throw them away. And then there are these middle things. What do I do with this one? It's old, but it was my mother's or father's, you know. And that's what I did with my faith. And I did it by writing books about it. So um, back to where we started the conversation on writing, yeah. that's that's what I do. I I was saturated in, in extreme faith. And you talk about de- deconstructing, you're right. There are a lot of people, a lot of American evangelicals for sure, and I wrote this book, Where the Light Fell, in large part to reach them. I've heard there are as many as 25 to 30 million ex-evangelicals. Maybe they have some some wistful memories of going to Young Life clubs or a summer camp or something, or even a church music service. But they got turned off because of the church's attitude uh, toward, I don't know, vaccines or uh, gay people or divorced people or science, you know, <laughs> a lot of things will turn young people off, some of them very justifiably. And I, I'd like to reach some of those people because what I learned is the worst thing you can do when you're deconstructing is to destruct, <laughs> just mm. throw it all away. Um, yes, we need to reconstruct. I, I like Richard Rohr's three phrases. phases. He talks about Order, disorder, reorder. And that's the story of my life. I was raised in this tightly ordered world. And then it became disorder because I ran up against a reality that contradicted it. It couldn't, couldn't be true. And then I had to gradually fit it together in a reorder. We all have to do that. That's a healthy thing. Hmm. But, um, just be careful, especially if you, if you walk away from church completely, it, it's so hard to get back in, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it's you're just out of the habit. It, there are easier things to do, more fun things to do on Sunday morning than go to church, admittedly. But what's the trade-off? If, if you're trading off a chance to connect with the God who created the universe and runs the universe, the God who loves us, if you're trading that off because of the way the church offended you in some way, that's a really bad trade. Mm-hmm. I, I mentioned in the book that... Uh, a nephew sent me a saying he found kind of like a Chinese fortune cookie, found it under a bottle cap. And it said, an idea cannot be, he- cannot be responsible for those who claim to believe it. An idea cannot be mm. responsible for those who claim to believe it. To me, that's a way of saying, don't blame God for the church. <laughs> you know, don't judge God by the church. And I, I love conversations with these ex-evangelicals because I said, well, tell me your story. Why'd you leave the church? And they tell me the story. I said, well, you're right. You know, actually, the church is a lot worse than that. Let me tell you my church. And they look at me and say, well, wait a minute. I thought you were a Christian writer. I said, yeah, I am. But, you know, to trade away God (laughs) because of the way what the church did to me 50 years ago, that's a bad trade. Who loses there? Does God lose? I lose. I lose. And uh, so I, I hope. Younger people who are struggling with their faith or some of your youth leaders, you know, uh, will, will hold out. And, and some of those kids, they're exactly what the church needs. Yeah. The church needs their bright minds, their questioning spirit. And God is on their side. The Bible's on their side. I like to tell people, I dare you to find a single argument against God by any of the great atheists that isn't already included in the Bible. Psalms, mm. Lamentations, Job, Ecclesiastes, they're all there. And I respect a God who not only gives us the freedom to reject him, but gives us the words that we can use <laughs> in the Bible itself. So don't, you know, don't judge God by the church. God can take it. God can take your struggles. Just don't stop it. Don't stop struggling, you know. Don't walk away. Do you mind sharing with us what that conversion was, that radical conversion, totally understanding that other people may not have had that kind of dramatic experience, but it obviously changed your life. Right. Yes. Um, At this Bible college, every student had to have a Christian service, and they had a bunch of them lined up. 
one year I got the plum assignment of university work and we were supposed to go to the, this local university and witness, evangelize. And I tried it a couple of times and got nowhere. And then I found out the student center there was a very nice plush place that had television. We didn't have television on the Bible college campus. Hmm. So I would go and sit there and watch basketball games usually and then uh, come home. And then we'd have a prayer meeting later that week. And there were three friends there and they understood me, didn't hassle me. They, they were some of my only friends on the campus, Joe, Craig and Chris. And Joe would pray, Craig would pray and Chris would pray. And then they would wait a plight, maybe 10 seconds. I never prayed. They knew who I was. I was the campus renegade. Well, we had been given an assignment in a class to write a paper on some time when God spoke to you. Hmm. And I was racking my brain because I believed God had never spoken to me. And if he did, I couldn't tell it from the times when I thought he spoke to me. Again, how do you tell the real from the fake? So I didn't know what in the world I was going to write about. But that was in the back of my mind. And for some reason, I have no idea why, for the only time that semester, Joe prayed, Chris prayed, Craig prayed, then they paused, and I prayed. <laughs> and my prayer went like this, God, you know, we're supposed to go down to that university and keep these kids from going to hell. But frankly, I don't care if they all go to hell. And I mean, it, you have to go on a Bible college campus to realize how that came across at the time. I could have, I could have been doing witchcraft dances naked and it wouldn't have had any more effect, you know? So it was very tense, very tense in the room. And, and then I said, I don't care if I go to hell and even more tense. And just one of these kind of sassy, arrogant prayers of need. And then I, I had a revelation. I mean, I, I actually saw this. You could call it a vision, I suppose. Who knows? But but I had recently been reading the story of the Good Samaritan, and I actually saw a person I took to be the Good Samaritan who came across this muddied, filthy tramp lying in a ditch. And And, you know, the religious people passed him by, and then the Samaritan, the, the heretic, came and bent over. And I saw that, that I was actually the tramp in the ditch. I mean, my face was the face of the tramp in the ditch. And the Samaritan bent over me, and I saw, actually, it wasn't a Samaritan. It was, it was Jesus, the face of Jesus. And every time he would bend over, I would spit in his face. And it was, a, it was a revelation. That's all I saw. It was just so shocking because that's obviously not what this parable of Good Samaritan is about, but, but it was, it just came from nowhere. <laughs> How could I have come up with that? And it exposed me for what I was. I was, I thought I was smarter, more sophisticated, uh, more enlightened than the people at this Bible college campus. Mm -hmm. And then I saw I was the neediest one of all. Wow. And wow. when God tried to express grace, I would spit in his face. Hmm. And I just didn't know what to do. Finally, I just got up and left the room. I didn't finish the prayer. And I said, please don't ever ask me about this again to, the, to my friends. Well, then I'd tell the story. We were supposed to read these things in class, but they almost ran out of class time and I stood up and read my story finally, and again asked people, "Don't, don't, don't welcome me to the club. I don't want any pats on the back. I'm just telling you what happened." And I wrote uh, my girlfriend, who became my wife later, at the time, a, a note that night saying, "I may have had the mo the first authentic religious experience in my life, but I won't know yet. It may fade away, <laughs> like all the rest." And it didn't fade away, it changed everything. And again, um, people, people can explain things away. I mean, I can explain things away. When, when people would tell a story like that to me, I would say, well, obviously you had this psychological blah, 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 and explain it away. But when it happened to me, I couldn't explain it away. And it came after 
it came after the softening of music and nature and romantic love. And then the final step was seeing who I was and seeing who God was. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you did. A um, couple more questions, Philip. Your dad, so you were in your early 20s when you mm-hmm. learned the story of his death, right? Can you, can you pick Actually, up I think that I was, moment? I think I was only 18. Oh, you were 18. Um, okay. Yeah. Pardon. But you were, you I, were looking through a scrapbook to or something a like that? Yeah. Right. I was in this Bible college and I had fallen in love. And so um, on one of our holidays, Christmas or Thanksgiving or something, I got my my girlfriend to come with me to Atlanta to introduce her to my family. And we went to my grandparents' house, the Yanceys. And of course, she wants to know, tell me about the Yanceys. Uh, what's their heritage and stuff? And they pull out these scrapbooks and we see the pictures of those who fought in the Civil War for the South, of course, <laughs> and, and uh, the blacksmith shop that my grandfather worked in and all of these. And as I was going through the book with her, this old yellowed clipping fell out, and it was the Atlanta Constitution from December 1950. And there was a picture of a person I, I recognized immediately as my mother, younger version, of course. and. And she was feeding my father, who was obviously paralyzed, couldn't feed himself, lying in a bed, but he wasn't in an iron lung. And it was a story that I had never heard. I, of course, I knew that he had been in an iron lung, and I knew that he died. That's all I knew. But what I didn't know was the story of the faith healing. And the article was written by, I forget what the title was, but something like 5,000 people pray for his healing. And, and what a act of faith it was for Christians to have enough faith to remove him from this iron lung against medical advice that underscored that and move him to this other place. So I had never heard that story. I, I just, I had this image of my father as this spiritual giant, this mythological creature. And then suddenly I found, I found out that these people made a terrible mistake. They, my life was defined by a theological error. <laughs> they they decided they knew what God's will was more than God. Hmm. They decided what God should do. And I mean, they, they weren't, they loved him. They wanted the best for him, but they took on a prerogative they didn't have the right to take. And then it clicked into place. Now I understood why my mother was so fierce on this vow she made and why it looked like her whole world was falling apart when my brother went one direction and I didn't have a lot of potential at the time in her eyes either. And it it just, it clicked into place. And I realized how, how serious it is when we, when we speak for God. And, and a lot of my confusion in childhood was people who claimed to speak for God and then later I realized they didn't. Like the guys who would talk about the curse of ham theory. It's nonsense stuff. It's vile stuff. But they were treat, treating it like truth. And I was a kid. I didn't know any better. And when I, and, and when we do that, we set people up for a, a massive reaction against everything else that we said along the way. That was, uh, that was a huge moment. Here I am, 18 years old, and I had been, my mother, of course, knew this all along. So she kept waiting, waiting, waiting to get off the hook, as it were, to get off the hook for having participated in a decision that killed her husband. And the only way she knew to do that was through us, her, his two sons, her two sons. And we didn't look like we were going to fulfill that in any meaningful way. And so she went, she went ballistic, a little crazy. And I tell those stories too. But it all traces back to that unintentional error. Uh, again, they, they wanted the best for my father. Everybody wanted him well, but they weren't God. They didn't have the right to do that. 
So you mentioned very casually early on in the interview that your mother, who's still living, to the best of my knowledge, has never read any of your books. Never read she any claims, of your books. She claims not to. Yeah. I think she's maybe wow. skimmed them to look for her name or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you um, process that? There are more than a few leaders listening who've got huge parental wounds. And mm-hmm. as I move through your book and hear more of your story, Philip, it's like, man, that is a, a gaping chasm in your life. Like father who dies from a supposed faith healing gone wrong at the age of one, a mother who raised you in a white racist, paranoid fundamentalism and uh, a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling who has not, I guess she wouldn't have disowned you, but like will not read your book and considers you, I think you say, a disappointment. Gosh, Mm -hmm. that's a lot to process, Philip. Yeah, God God granted me resiliency. And that unhealthy period of time in high school when I'm trying to conquer pain, cold, and bad smells and things like that actually served me well because it I was able to survive yeah. whatever life threw at me. Just barely survive, but survive. And and then I've been blessed. You know, I, I say I look at my life and I was twenty years under law and fifty years under grace. That's a pretty good ratio, actually, <laughs> you know, because I, I got a father. This Getting Dr. Paul Brand, uh, you couldn't ask for a better father. Wow. And, and God put him right smack in my, in my lap. And we didn't have to go through all that teenage individuation years. You know, he just treated me like a son, and I treated him like a father. Wow. And, and I've been married 50 years to the, that same girl who was sitting next to me at my grandparents' house. So, um, I, How do you I really, relate to your mother today? How do you relate to her? <clears throat> Even since the book was turned in, Carrie, there have been some amazing things. I waited so long to write this book because, as I mentioned, I was afraid of the effect of my family. And it, even if you tell the truth as, as honestly as you can, you're going to hurt people. Hmm. And I... And these are severe stories, some of them. And no problem with my brother. He read the manuscript in several drafts and left it and sobbed and feels it validated his life and various things like that. But my mother, I just feared hurting her. She's 97 years old. Um, After I turned in the manuscript, this woman who hasn't heard her, her son's voice in 51 years, said, I'd like to talk to your brother. She didn't say my son. <laughs> she said, I'd like to talk to your brother. Could you get us on a phone call together? And I did. And we've had three three-way phone calls. They haven't gone especially well. She'll say, Marshall, do you remember when, when you came down and told us you received Jesus as your personal Savior? No. You don't remember that? No. Well, you did. I'm an atheist. What? I'm an atheist. You're not an atheist. I am too. I mean, conversations like that. And, uh, and I'm kind of the, the referee in the middle. What did he say? He said a bad word, mother. Ah, uh, that's what I thought he said. <laughs> you know? oh. But, but then the most astonishing thing happened. On his own, without my prompting, my brother, who's had a stroke, it's hard for him. He only has the left hand that works. It's very hard for him to mail anything, you know, to open the envelope, write, stuff something in it. Wrote her a card. First card he sent her in 50-some years. And it had three words on it. I forgive you. I, I could never have predicted that. Now, my mother... Uh, she's a pretty tough woman. Her response, she told her sister, who's still living, I don't know what he thinks I need forgiving, need to forgive, need forgiving for. Uh, you know, this is a woman who hasn't sinned, but, uh, In 70 years now, I guess. But, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but still, there's, they're softening their baby steps. And I think, uh, the, my brother uses the word validated. He said, your book validated my life. Because it, it showed what we went through 
and then it showed how I got through and some of the choices I made. Maybe people can understand them now. Wow. And, and so it's, it's a tale of two sons. Now it's a tale of grace. Yeah. And, and when I wrote, wrote it at the end, I looked back and it's so clear. All of my books eventually get around to two themes, one of two themes, suffering and grace. Mm. Because I, I learned a lot of suffering growing up and I didn't learn a lot of grace, but I've learned a lot since. And, uh, that's what I spent my life exploring. <laughs> Philip, keep exploring. Wow. I'm pretty emotional at the end of this uh, this interview. Thank you for sharing so vulnerably, so personally, um, so generously um, in the book, in this conversation. I am I am so so grateful. The book is called Where the Light Fell, and you can get it anywhere books are sold. And Philip, where can people connect with you online these days? Website, social. What are what are some yeah, good places I'm to find? Yeah, restricted. I don't I don't tweet. I don't Instagram, Snapchat, those kind of things. But uh, I do have a, a website. It's just my name, Philip philipyancy dot com, and I have uh, I use Facebook. I post a blog periodically there, at least once a month, and various other things along the way. So, um, I'd I, I guess I'd like to add one more word, Carrie, and this is Please something do. I learned. Something I learned as a journalist, because I've interviewed a lot of people, and I came away with this phrase that redeemed pain, pain redeemed, impresses me more than pain removed. Hmm. So many people, I've heard their stories, like a Johnny Erickson Tata or somebody like that, and and when, uh, when a bad thing happens, or even my childhood, you, you want God to change it. You want God to reverse it, to bring my father back to life, to do, you know, to do these things. But we don't really have the promise that he's going to do that every time. Well, we do have the promise. It's a, that old Romans 8 passage that no matter what the things are, look at the things in Paul's life, the prisons, the beatings, the shipwreck, the snake bites. Those things can be used by God with us to make us into the person he wants. And, and at the end of the book, I really had no regrets. I, mm. I felt nothing was wasted. Uh, just revisiting. I didn't feel those flashes of anger again. They, they were healed. They were redeemed. And I hold that out it just as hope for people listening. Wow. Philip, this has been a journey. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. So glad you tuned in. I hope it helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you haven't checked it out yet, head on over to the Art of Leadership Academy. In that, I give you everything you need to lead, run, and grow a church. We'll see you next time.